Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's employment law seminar. My name is Marty Rabinovich. I am the head of the employment group at Devery Smith Frank and a partner at the firm, and uh, I will be your presenter for today. So for any human resources professionals who are in attendance this morning, the program has been approved for uh, HRPA CPD hours. So after the seminar, we will we will send you a code to uh, to claim your CPD hours for human resources professionals. If you if you don't receive it for any reason, please please contact us to make sure that you can claim your hours. And for any lawyers in attendance for today's seminar, the program has been approved and qualifies for 1.5 substantive CPD hours through the Law Society of Ontario. So on the agenda for today, we'll start with uh, the introduction, and then we will get right into the content. So today I will be I will be speaking about four key appellate decisions in the employment law world of 2024. And then we will uh, we will get into uh, one other key decision called uh, DUFO, which is a very important case about termination provisions. That is not an appellate decision, but it's very, very important. So it did make the cut for today's seminar. So we will discuss the five cases. We will then take a break for approximately 15 minutes. We will come back at about 11.10 for the Q&A period. And then after the Q&A period, we will conclude the seminar. Now on the, the topic of questions and answers, I am going to answer the most frequently asked question that we get at these seminars right now. Yes, the slides will be available after the presentation. They will be available both on our firm's website. And if you would like a copy of the slides emailed to you, we can do that too. So please feel free to send me an email requesting the slides and I will happily send you a copy myself. Okay, so let's get right into our key appellate decisions of 2024. So the first case that we will address today is called Croak and Vupoint Systems Limited. So here, the appellant, also the employee, Mr. Croak, was employed by Vupoint Systems as a systems technician for residential TV and smart home internet services. And Vupoint's main clients were Bell Canada and Bell Express View. So we'll just refer to uh, those two entities as Bell. So Bell accounted for 99% roughly of Vupoint's income. So obviously quite significant, uh, just about all of Vupoint's income was from Bell. So Bell implements a, a mandatory COVID-19 vaccination policy. And Vupoint follows suit uh, and introduces its own vaccination policy uh, around September of 2021. So essentially, Vupoint felt that if, if Bell was going to require its technicians to be vaccinated against COVID-19 and 99% of its income was coming from Vupoint or from Bell, sorry, it absolutely needed Bell as a client. So Bell was essentially required to introduce its own vaccination policy. So Mr. Croak refuses to disclose his vaccination status. Um, and uh, as a result, he can now, he's now in contravention of the policy uh, because, uh, because he now can't show that he was vaccinated. So eventually what happens is Bell or, yeah, Vupoint, sorry, terminates uh, Mr. Croak's employment and asserts frustration of contract. So essentially, Vupoint is asserting that the contract is no longer capable of being performed as a result of, of Bell's vaccination policy. 
And Vupoint also made the argument that Bell's policy was beyond its control and uh, its introduction was not reasonably foreseeable. So in other words, that it was completely something different than what would have been contemplated by the parties at the time the initial employment contract was entered into. The employee took the, the position that this was, in fact, a wrongful dismissal um, and that frustration did not apply and that Vupoint had not adequately warned him of the consequences of non-compliance with the policy. So in other words, Mr. Croak was saying that he was never told that had the that had he failed to comply with the policy, his employment would have been terminated. So at, at the trial court uh, on a summary judgment motion, the court did agree with Vupoint's position and found that the contract was frustrated. So specifically the court held that the vaccination policy was an unforeseen circumstance, which was not contemplated by either party when the plaintiff and the defendant entered into the employment relationship in 2014. And uh, the court further determined uh, that Mr. Croak's complete inability to perform the duties of his job for the foreseeable future amounted to a radical change that struck at the root of the employment contract. So essentially, that is frustration. That is the definition of frustration right there. In fact, during the working notice period that that the employer provided to Mr. Croak, uh, he did in fact confirm that, that he would not be vaccinated. And the, the court at the trial level also did not accept Mr. Croak's argument that he wasn't adequately warned about the consequences. In fact, the court found exactly the opposite, that Mr. Croak was, was very well aware of what was going to happen if he was unable to comply with the policy. So the employee appeals this case up to the, the Court of, of Appeal. Um, so, uh, so here we have a little bit more about uh, the definition of frustration of contract that the court looked at. Okay. And uh, the court also noted, we're, we're still in the Superior Court actually here, the court noted that the legal effect of a contract that is frustrated is essentially to for the parties to treat the contract as being at an end. So in other words, neither party has any other further obligation under the contract. So in the employment world, what that means is there is no common law notice period. Okay. However, in the employment law world, if a contract is frustrated because of illness and injury, Ill, illness or injury under the Employment Standards Act and uh, the applicable regulation here, the employee would still be entitled to their minimum Employment Standards Act entitlements, but still nothing at common law. So when the case went to the Court of Appeal, there were four specific questions that are set out here in the slide uh, that Mr. Croak was, uh, was raising. Um, essentially, what, was the contract frustrated or not? Was this really a supervening event? Was Mr. Croak adequately warned um, that his vaccination status would result in termination? In summary, uh, the court decided in favor of the employer, so it upheld the Superior Court's decision. Um, so in doing so, the court again went through the, the criteria uh, for frustration of contract, the court addressed the issue of what actually was the supervening event, and they found that it was really Bell's vaccination policy that essentially forced Vupoint to introduce their own vaccination policy, which was the supervening event. So therefore, that was an event that had not been caused by the parties to this case, so not caused by Croak, not caused by Vupoint, and therefore, uh, the test for frustration uh, was still was, was still made out. Um, there was some discussion about uh, the extra extraordinary response that was quite required as a result of the pandemic, and I mean again everything was just so unforeseen. Um, 
And then just uh, here, I'll, I'll just make a note here that the court did note that the situation would have been a little bit different if Mr. Croak had told the employer that he intended to get vaccinated, but simply that he needed a little bit more time, in which case then the court might have came to a decision that was a bit more employee friendly. But but essentially, Voot Point had no choice but to introduce the vaccination policy if they wanted to keep their relationship with Bell. And Mr. Croak made it very clear that he wasn't going to get vaccinated. So his contract was frustrated and the employer won. So takeaways here uh, from this case, um, vaccination policies in particular, if they were essentially forced on one employer to maintain a key client relationship, absolutely can amount to frustration of contract, which would, uh, which would result in the employee's entitlement being greatly reduced or in some cases eliminated altogether. So that is the case of uh, Croak. Now, before I get on to the next case, um, I, I did notice uh, that uh, that there were a few uh, virtual hands that were being raised. Um, so just uh, on the topic again of questions and answers, if you have any questions about uh, any of the material or any questions generally that come to mind, please feel free to type them in the ask a question a spot on uh, on Zoom webinar, and I will address as many of those questions as I can during the Q and A period. So the next case here, um, Giacomo Donato and uh, Pear Tree Securities Inc. So the plaintiff, uh, Mr. Donato, the employee, was uh, an experienced and successful investment banker in the mining sector. His former employer was a company called Pear Tree. And Mr. Donato held the role of president and co-head of banking at his former employer. So the employee in this case gets terminated back in January of 2018 without cause. That's not in dispute. So without cause termination, the employee is entitled to a severance package. And the issue, as we'll see here, is really which contract is going to determine the severance so that's exactly what happened. There's a lawsuit for wrongful dismissal, and there's, in fact, two contracts, and the dispute really is about which contract applies. Uh, the employer also counterclaimed and argued that Mr. Donato had breached uh, uh, his non-competition uh, and non-solicitation provisions uh, when he went to work with a competitor about nine months afterwards. Um, I won't say too much more about that counterclaim other than it was largely uh, largely uh, dismissed by the courts. So the courts essentially found that it was it was frivolous and couldn't be shown. So the counterclaim is not really a factor in this case. So so as we've said, Mr. Donato's employment was wrongfully dismissed. So therefore, he's entitled to wrongful dismissal damages or more colloquially a severance package. Uh, the court found that the second employment contract was the one that governed Mr. Donato's entitlements, which um, unfortunately for him and uh, fortunately for the employer was the contract that resulted in him getting a lesser amount of compensation. And then, as we've said already, Pear Tree's counterclaim was, was uh, dismissed and they were effectively just trying to limit competition, which, uh, which the court did not accept as a valid basis for that claim. The first employment contract was signed back in April of 2016. Um, and at the time, Mr. Donato informed Eritrea of the financial implications at his prior employer if he were to leave prior to December 1st of 2016. Um, so in response, Pear Tree really wanted him to come. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't exactly specified, you know, what these financial implications were in the case, but presumably the employee would have missed out on a forty thousand dollar bonus if he if he left his former employer early. So Pear Tree says, "Okay, no problem. We will pay you an additional forty thousand dollars," and that got incorporated into the second employment contract. Okay. Now, in the lawsuit, P. 
Pear Tree submits that uh, the first employment contract was merely an agreement to agree, and that's not how the court uh, viewed that issue. Um, the court did find that the first employment contract uh, it did include the essential terms of an employment contract, um, but the issue, as we'll see, is whether or not you know there was adequate consideration for the second contract or whether there was another basis for which it should be held unenforceable. So throughout June and July of 2016 um, is, is when the terms of the, of the second employment contract were discussed. Um, and in the second contract, there were some significant changes that were being pro proposed by Pear Tree, uh, which would have ultimately reduced um, Mr. Donato's compensation. And he was faced with a situation where he would have been terminated unless he agreed to the terms of the second employment contract. Um, so ultimately, on July of 2016, he decides that he doesn't want to risk being terminated, so he signs the second employment contract. Now, later in the litigation, though, he's saying that he felt pressured into signing it and didn't really accept it. Now, in a case called Ronco, the court has set out what the employee's three options would be if they were presented with a contract that they did not agree with and did not want to sign. So that's the position that the employee is asserting here in court, although that wasn't necessarily clear to anyone at the time. So... If you're being presented with a new contract and you're not, you don't really like it, you nevertheless, as an employee, have the option to accept it. You could also reject it and sue the employer for damages pursuant to the first contract, the one that you're actually bound by, or to make it very, very clear to the employer that you don't accept the new offer that is being presented to you as an employee, and then essentially leave it up to the employer to decide how they're going to proceed. So as we know, Mr. Donato chose the first option, i.e. to simply sign the, the contract. Now, so it was in Mr. Donato's interest to have the first contract be the only applicable one because he would have gotten a much greater severance package if that were the case. So one of his arguments was that there was no fresh consideration for the second agreement and therefore it should be unenforceable. Um, however, the court disagreed and, and noted that Mr. Donato received both two additional weeks of paid vacation and a $40,000 bonus payment, which was very nice consideration. Um, there was some discussion as to whether or not the power imbalance between Pear Tree and Mr. Donato should play into the enforceability issue. Um, the court accepted that there, there would be, there would always be really an imbalance of power between an employer and an employee. However, the court in this case found that there were a number of factors that mitigated that power imbalance. So, for example, the employee was sophisticated, represented by a lawyer. The negotiations, you know, took, you know, one month to complete. Uh, there was access to information about the company that was provided to Mr. Donato and how it would ultimately affect his compensation. And here's a, a quote about consideration. So essentially consideration is something new and of value um, that, that the employee would need to receive in order for this new contract to be enforceable. Now, the court made it clear here that the court is not going to get into the adequacy of consideration. So they're essentially looking for, is there something clear? Is it, is it new? And is it a clear benefit that the employee did not have before? The court is not going to get into a weighing analysis and say, well, the employee got, got A, but lost B, and therefore the deal is overall worse for the employee, and therefore it's not enforceable. They're not going to do it that way. If there was anything new, anything of value that the employee received in exchange for, a, for signing a new contract, even if that new contract also largely benefits the employer, that will meet the consideration requirement. Okay. Um, the court held that cons the consideration here was not a mere peppercorn. There's a quote from another case, which we'll see 
where the court essentially says, you know, sort of in, in theory, uh, you know, consider, consideration could be a peppercorn because, again, we're not going to be getting into the adequacy analysis in terms of whether or not there's a, there's sufficient consideration. But in any case, the court finds that that two additional weeks of paid vacation and forty thousand dollars are absolutely more than a mere peppercorn. So absolutely, there was consideration here. So. The employee appeals this decision to the, the Court of Appeal, um, essentially arguing that the first employment contract should have applied because there was no consideration. OK, the Ontario Court of Appeal dismissed the appeal and agreed with the trial judge. Um, so here's the other case that we mentioned before, Lancia and Park Dentistry, uh, where, where the court held that it's trite law that courts will not inquire into the adequacy of consideration. A, quote, peppercorn will do. Now, as a matter of practice, I mean, when you are looking to implement new contracts for your employees, um, I, I would make sure that, you know, as a matter of practice, you probably want to provide something more than, than you know, the, uh, the theoretical peppercorn. So, I mean, in this case, you've got the example of additional weeks of paid vacation and a $40,000 bonus. It doesn't even have to be that much. It could be a smaller signing bonus. It could be, you know, a few days of vacation, pay, right? The adequacy is not going to be something the courts are going to get into in their analysis, okay? So the key takeaway here um, is that consideration is required for a new contract to be enforceable, um, but it just has to exist. There's not going to be a, a weighing exercise in terms of whether it was sufficient consideration. We will now move along to our third case, and this one is called uh, Kermpotic and Thunder Bay Electronics Limited. So here we have an employee who was uh, 59 years old. He was employed as a carpenter and he worked at his former employer for almost 30 years. And he was terminated within two hours of returning to his job after a back surgery. A quick note actually, just before we go on. So these slides do refer to employers, plural. And the reason for that is there was another defendant in this case called Hill Street Financial Services, Inc. And that the court held was a common employer with uh, Thunder Bay. So that's why we're talking about employers here. So in any case, the employee needed back surgery. He had suffered a number of workplace injuries throughout the course of his employment. And uh, after termination, he did receive uh, um, some salary and, uh, and benefits. Um, coverage. Uh, the employee, though, does bring a claim against his employer for wrongful dismissal. So in other words, um, the uh, 16 months he felt was insufficient. And he also claimed for mental distress and uh, aggravated and moral damages. As an aside, aggravated and moral damages are interchangeable. They refer to exactly the same thing in the employment law world. So the trial judge's decision, first, he, he addressed the issue of reasonable notice, and the court held that the employee was entitled to a 24-month notice period. So 24 months is an excellent result. The unofficial cap on common law reasonable notice is 24 months. I should qualify that a little bit, though. There have been some recent cases where the courts have awarded amounts like 26 months, 27 months. There were a couple of 30 months, which I think we addressed at earlier at the earlier seminar this year. And in one case, uh, a, a judge even said that they would have awarded more than 30 months if the employee's lawyer had asked for it. So the cases are trending higher, but you know, 24 months is still the traditional unofficial cap and still a very good result for for the employee here. And one of the arguments that the employer made was that the employee had failed to, to mitigate his damages and had not made reasonable efforts to do so. The court dealt with that argument pretty quickly and said, you know, look, this employee is a carpenter. He's 59 years old. He's recovering from back surgery. 
you know, it, it's not really a shock that he's not going to be able to perform work as a carpenter. So, so that argument about mitigation did not really go so well for the employer. The trial judge dismissed the employee's claim for mental distress damages um, because there wasn't um, any medical or psychological evidence um, that the manner of termination caused the distress. However, the trial judge awarded $50,000 for aggravated damages because the manner of termination was the antithesis of an employer's duty to be candid, reasonable, honest, and forthright, and to refrain from engaging in conduct that is unfair or in bad faith by being untruthful, misleading, or unduly insensitive. And the employer did not like that and wanted to appeal. So the issue, the, the two issues on appeal were first, whether or not the uh, the employee uh, failed to meet his duty to mitigate. So in other words, take steps to find a reasonable, sorry, take, take reasonable steps to find a new job. And the second issue was whether or not the there was an error in awarding the, the aggravated damages related to the manner of termination. Uh, the Court of Appeal dismissed the appeal. So in other words, the trial judge's decision was upheld. So with respect to mitigation, uh, the, the the Court of Appeal said, look, you know, the trial judge got it right. Uh, the trial court is entitled to deference on this issue. And uh, the finding that uh, that uh, the employee did what he could, considering his age, back surgery, and inability to perform required physical labor for his occupation was reasonable. So the, the Court of Appeal was not going to interfere with that decision. And the Court of Appeal also noted that medical evidence would not be required in order to uh, to establish the employee's physical incapacity for the purpose of mitigation. Um, yet, in any case, because the employee had just undergone surgery, I mean, there was significant medical evidence available in support of the employee's position anyway. And then the issue uh, with respect to... Uh, to, to mental distress um, that the court looked at here. Um, so basically what the court said at the end of the day is there are really there are really three there are three areas or three categories. okay you, you, you've got mental distress uh, that someone suffers as a result of the manner of dismissal that does result in a diagnosable, medical, psychological condition for which there is going to be medical evidence. And that category will absolutely be compensable. Then there's the category at the other end where someone who is terminated suffers what the courts have termed the normal distress and hurt feelings resulting from dismissal, and those are, are non-compensable. Okay. But then the court says, we also believe that there's actually a third category, which is in the middle of the two. So in other words, it's when the employee experiences distress that is beyond what would be considered normal, but doesn't quite rise to, to the level of a medical psychological condition for which there's going to be supporting medicals. So what the court has made clear here is that in the second category, even if there's no medical evidence, um, these sorts of awards can still be made. Okay. Now, of course, if, if an employee suffers distress, mental distress to the point that they do get diagnosed with a, a new medical condition or an older pre-existing condition is aggravated, the quantum, the amount of those damages awards are likely to be higher than a case that would fall in the middle category. But nonetheless, um, employers should remember that just because an employee doesn't have medical evidence in support of mental distress that uh, they are claiming, uh, the court still does have the jurisdiction to, to make that award. Okay, so how did the employer breach its duty of good faith? Um, well, first of all, the employer claimed that the employee was dismissed for financial reasons, and that they had documentation to prove that, yet never actually produced it. In fact, on the other hand, 
the trial judge found that the employers were neither candid nor forthright. In fact, the employee was terminated because he had physical limitations and he had gone to have a back surgery. Okay, and the court was also not pleased with the fact that within two hours of returning to work, the employee was terminated. Um, I, I suspect that uh, the employer in this case did not have the benefit of of legal advice at that time because uh, because that would that that would be hard to imagine. Okay, so what do we take away from this case? Um, with respect to mit mit mitigation, if an employee is unable to mitigate in part because they are physically incapacitated, uh, medical evidence will not be required for that. Um, and then secondly, an employee is not required to show a diagnosable mental injury in order to be awarded aggravated damages arising from the manner of their dismissal. Okay. Let's get into the next one. So this case is York Region District School Board and the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario. This case made it made its way up to the Supreme Court of Canada. It was decided earlier this year. Um, a quick note on, on the Supreme Court. There are not too many cases in the employment law world that make their way up to the Supreme Court of Canada. So for so for the for employment lawyers in particular, it's always uh, it's always neat when we have employment cases that do make their way up to the Supreme Court. One reason for that is that the Supreme Court will only take on cases that it deems to be of national importance. And if you were to look at the statistics, it's a very, very small percentage. Of, of cases that the Supreme Court takes on. I mean, there are many, many, many cases um, in which the lawyers seek permission to have the Supreme Court appeal or hear their appeals from the from the provincial appellate courts, but it's a very, very small percentage of cases that the Supreme Court actually takes on. So so this, this one is, is neat in that the, the Supreme Court took it on. So anyway, this case is took place in the unionized world and also in a school. So here, there were two teachers who kept a log using a shared uh, Google Docs document, which they accessed through their personal email accounts. And in this document, they discussed negative opinions about a fellow teacher, and this was being done on a board-issued laptop. So essentially, they're, they're making disparaging comments to each other about, you know, behind the back of, of one of their colleagues. So another teacher hears about this and uh, reports it to the principal. So the principal asks the school or the board's IT department uh, to search for the log on any of the board's data storage devices and is unable to find anything. But then the fact Story goes, the principal then enters one of the teacher's classrooms for an unrelated purpose, sees that the laptop is open, and uh, finds the document on the screen. And then, of course, without permission of the teacher involved, scrolls through it and takes pictures of the document on his phone. And then from there, the teacher's computers get seized and then subsequently searched by the board. So now that the board had in its possession the evidence of what these teachers were talking about, the board decides to give the teachers written reprimands or a, a written warning, which would remain in their in their personnel file for a period of time. And it's it's still a relatively low form of discipline. Now, the, the union was not pleased with this because of the alleged privacy breaches, and presumably the employees were not happy about this either. So even though it was a relatively small discipline, the union files a grievance on behalf of the employees and alleges that the search violated the teacher's right to privacy. So in particular, the issues were the IT search, 
the principal's initial search of the of the classroom computer and also the seizure and search of the teacher's computers. So the arbitrator, the grievance arbitrator hears from both sides and essentially engages in what, what the court calls a balancing of interest framework. So in other words, we now have to balance the teacher's expectations of privacy versus the school board's legitimate interest in managing their workplace and taking steps to address a seemingly toxic workplace. And the arbitrator says, look, we side with the board. We think those interests are more important. So grievance dismissed. The case then gets, gets uh, in front of the divisional court. So that would be actually an application for a judicial review to get from a, a grievance arbitrator's decision to the divisional court. And the divisional court also agrees with the arbitrator. Um, and the majority at the divisional court found that, uh, that there were no charter issues um, because uh, section eight of the charter, which if applicable would, would protect would protect the employees from unreasonable search and, and seizure. Um, the divisional court essentially said, well, that doesn't apply because there is no section eight right to privacy in a workplace environment as opposed to the criminal context, okay? Um, there was a dissent, which you'll hear a more, bit more about later, but in any case, the divisional court agreed with the arbitrator. The case then makes its way up to the court of appeal which is the highest court in Ontario. And at the Court of Appeal is where things start to go off the rails a little bit for the employer and things start to go better for the employee. So here, the Court of Appeal allowed the appeal. So in other words, disagreed with the arbitrator and upheld the grievance. And the Court of Appeal reasoned that Section 8 of the Charter did in fact imply apply here because school boards are governmental in nature, a quick charter review, the charter only applies to government or government actors. Um, and therefore section eight applied and the court of appeal on the facts found that the, the searches were unreasonable. And then we get up to the Supreme Court of Canada. So the, pre, the Supreme Court accepted to take on or to hear this appeal. And the Supreme Court appeal focused really on two issues. So the first one being whether or not the charter applies to public school boards in Ontario. And secondly, whether the arbitrator's award should have been set aside for failing to conduct any analysis under Section 8. Um, and the Supreme Court answered yes to both questions. So number one, yes, the charter does apply to school boards in Ontario, public school boards, I should say. And number two, yes, as the arbitrator did not engage in any Section 8 analysis, uh, the grievance should be, uh, the, the grievance should be upheld. And then in Obiter, which we'll touch on very briefly, the court did engage a little bit further with Section 8 and, and issues about the privacy of school employees more broadly. Okay, so th this is the first issue with respect to whether or not the, the charter applies. There, there's some language here about, you know, what constitutes government. Um, the government entities are defined in Section 32 of the charter. Um, at the end of the day, it was a fairly simple analysis. Uh, the, the court said, look, the Education Act makes it clear that Ontario public school boards are government in nature. Um, we should note that the court did not expressly address whether the charter applies to public schools in other provinces. However, I would say the answer is probably yes on that one. And then whether or not the charter would apply to private schools. Um, that one is, you know, a little bit less clear cut. But um, if I had to venture an opinion on that one, if that issue were to come back before the courts, I, I would say that um, there, there's certainly less of a chance that there's going to be the charter applying to private schools. 
very different, very big differences between public school boards um, and private schools. But I may stand corrected. We will we will see one day. And then issue number two about uh, the lack of Section 8 analysis, um, the court said, yep, the arbitrator didn't engage in Section 8, so we have to set aside that decision. And then the, the obiter here, um, essentially what the court said here was be careful against adopting the Section 8 framework um, that's established for a criminal context to an employment context. So in other words, the criminal framework can help us um, deal with Section 8 issues in the employment law world, but we just have to not forget at the end of the day that there are differences. Okay, so I, I will leave this slide for you to peruse um, on your own. Um, there's a little bit more here on, on what the test should be for whether there's a reasonable expectation of privacy um, for employers. One thing you can do in that regard is you can introduce in a contract or introduce in a policy uh, terms about what degree of privacy an employee has or should expect. So you can include terms such as the employee shall have no expectation of privacy, um, you know, with respect to, you know, any company owned computers. I mean, there's no guarantee that's necessarily going to solve all of the problems, but if you communicate to an employee that they, that they should not expect, you know, much or any privacy that is likely to help employers when it comes to these sorts of these sorts of cases, if they're trying to to rely on on you know lessened expectations of privacy in the context of Section Eight, um, and then this slide is about uh, what we call the Collins framework um, about whether or not searches and seizures are uh, reasonable. So the court went into some detail on this here. Okay, so key takeaways here. Um, so you know, be careful as an employer about uh, expectations of privacy for employees. Consider addressing those sorts of issues in contracts uh, or policies. Um, and we do have a clear decision here for, for anyone out there, you know, in education or who works at school board, uh, that public school boards in Ontario are considered government for the purposes of the charter. So uh, watch out. Okay, the last case that we're going to get into is called Dufo and the Corporation of the Township of Ignis decided in uh, earlier this year, 2024. I think it was decided back in, uh, in February, February, I believe. So this is a case that uh, that, that has made things challenging yet again for employers who are looking to to have enforceable termination provisions in their contracts which effectively will limit an employee's entitlement to to their minimum employment standards act entitlements so in, in this case uh, the, the plaintiff employee got terminated and uh, the termination happened before the end of her fixed term contract and uh, she uh, she was suing for for wrongful termination. The, uh, the township was relying on clause 4.0, which we'll see shortly uh, of the employment contract and uh, paid her paid her out based on the contract. Her termination was without cause. And just it's, it's fairly well established that if an employee, is terminated without cause before the end of a fixed term contract. If there's an early termination provision, that will govern. But if not, the employee gets to be paid or is entitled to payment up to the end of the, the contract. So here's clause 401, and I'll, I'll just draw your attention to some of the underlined text here, um, which causes some problems for this employer, as we'll, as we will see. Okay, and then here's section 4.02 and the underlying text causes further problems for the employer here. And we're looking specifically at the at the language which says the township may at its sole discretion and without cause terminate the 
this agreement and the employee's employment effectively by providing them with uh, with uh, the, the severance here set out uh, below, okay? So the court in this case had to look at the enforceability of the termination clause and basically if the clause was not enforceable, what damages would uh, the employee be entitled to? So in, in the Dufo case, the, the court spent some time reviewing the principles for determining the enforceability of, uh, of termination provisions. And the, the court looked or reviewed quite in detail a case called Henderson and Slavkin, which was decided within the last couple of years. So the court noted that employees have less bargaining power than employers. Employees are likely unfamiliar with employment standards in the ESA. The ESA is remedial legislation and courts therefore favor interpretations of the ESA that encourage employers to comply. Uh, the ESA should be interpreted in a way that encourages employers to draft compliant agreements. Uh, the termination clause will only rebut the presumption of a reasonable notice if the wording is clear. And if there are, if there is ambiguity and there's essentially multiple possible reasonable interpretations of a termination provision, the court will prefer the one that gives the greater benefit to the employee. So as we continue to see time and time again, um, the, the courts are very, very employee friendly in the province of Ontario. So and another important point here is just that uh, it's just that if a, a termination provision is inconsistent with the ESA, then it's going to be unenforceable. So as another recap, the Employment Standards Act sets out minimum entitlements of employees. So we sometimes call that a floor of rights. So the employer and the employee cannot contract out of the minimum entitlements that are set out in the Employment Standards Act. So the, the court does conclude that the termination provision here is not enforceable. Okay. And the first reason for the unenforceability um, is because the, the clause has an issue with it, which, which came up in, in other, in an earlier court of appeal case called Waxdale. We have addressed this specific issue in, in earlier seminars, but essentially if an employer is going to deprive an employee of their common law entitlements, they have to meet the standard of just cause. If an employee is going to deprive employer is going to deprive an employee or seeking to deprive an employee of their minimum ESA entitlements, they now have to show that the termination was for the higher standard of willful misconduct, disobedience, or willful neglect of duty, et cetera. And that is a higher standard. Okay. The easiest way of thinking about that is if an employee tries very hard, but they're bad at their job and they're really that bad at their job, that could be just cause. If an employee is being intentionally bad at their job, now we're probably getting into willful misconduct. Okay. There are other cases which address that issue, uh, which we're not going to have time to get into now. But for the purpose of this case, there are two standards. There's willful misconduct. There is just cause, and because because there's two standards, there's a scenario. There are scenarios where an employee could be terminated for just cause, but not for willful misconduct. So, in essence, it contravenes the ESA for an employer to say we can terminate your employment for willful misconduct by giving you nothing. Okay, um, or terminating your employment for cause by giving you nothing, because even if there is cause there could still be an entitlement if the termination was not for willful misconduct, okay? So that was one problem with the termination provision here, okay? Um, but the other problem that I want to address now um, is the one about the, the sole discretion language here that we saw before, okay? So the, 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 the issue that I just explained is sort of old news that that's been the law now for a couple of years. But the new problem that the court introduced in the uh, in, in the in Dufo and uh, the township uh, of Ignis is that the court is now saying that if an employer says in its termination provision that we can terminate your employment 
at any time in our sole discretion or in our sole discretion by providing you with A, B, and C. That now contravenes the ESA. Why? Because there are provisions in the ESA which entitle the employees first to a number of unpaid leaves of absence. These unpaid leaves are also job protected leaves, meaning that if an employee is on an unprotected leave at the end of the leave, they are entitled to be reinstated back into their same position or to a comparable position. So as per the court, it's actually a contravention to say that the employer can terminate at any time, because as per the ESA, the employer actually cannot terminate an employee while they are on a job protected unpaid leave. Okay. And then the other example that the court goes through in this case is about reprisal provisions. So if an employee complains to an employer about, about an alleged breach of their rights under the Employment Standards Act, and the employer says, well, you're terminated and see, you know, the clause says we can terminate whenever we want at our sole discretion, the court has now identified that as a problem as well. So the bad news for employers is many, many, many employers have or had this language in their contracts. If you have the language in, in your contracts, if you're not sure if you do, please don't hesitate to, to get in touch with me. I'd be happy to review it for you and update it for you. As I've said in many, many prior seminars, we do recommend that employers have their contracts reviewed and uh, and updated as necessary at least once a year. Okay, the good news for employers, number one, is that the fix here is not that complicated. You essentially need language to say that you can terminate as permitted by the Employment Standards Act. That's one piece of good news. And the second piece of good news is that this case actually has been appealed. So there is some chance that uh, that the appellate court will overturn this, although that is still very much to be determined and it's unlikely to, to happen anytime soon. All right. In terms of the calculation, that this is the calculation that you see on the screen here that the court did to figure out exactly what the employee was owed. Okay. So to conclude here, what do we take from this case? The old news, the reminders, if an employee is subject to termination from a fixed term employment contract, they are entitled to be paid the full remaining value of the contract. Another reminder, employers cannot contract out of the provisions of the ESA. The, establish, the ESA establishes a floor of rights for the employees. Termination clauses are to be interpreted in favor of the employee. Okay, that's also review. But now the new piece of information here is that language stating that the employer can terminate an employee in its sole discretion or really anything comparable to that is likely not enforceable because the courts have found that it breaches the Employment Standards Act. Okay, and I, I did mention that the decision has been appealed, but even if the appeal is going to be a successful one day, right now the state of the law is what the court has said in DUFO. So it's a very important decision. Good reminder to get those employment contracts reviewed by an employment lawyer at least once a year. Okay, on that note, let's take our break. We are going to come back at 11.10 to resume with the Q&A period. Um, if you have any questions that you haven't already posted in the, uh, the, the Q&A box here on Zoom webinar, please feel free to do so now. And then we'll come back at 11.10. I will answer as many questions as I can, and then we will wrap up the seminar. So enjoy your break, everyone, and we will see you at 11.10. Thank you.
Okay, welcome back, everyone. Hope you enjoyed the break. So we have three questions that have come through, which which I am going to address. Uh, before I get into them, uh, a lot of them are are sort of fairly specific fact patterns. So I I just want to be clear that that nothing uh, that you hear from me today should be construed as legal advice. And if you need specific legal advice about any particular employment law scenario, please feel free to contact uh, your employment lawyer, which hopefully is or will be me. So the first question says, if an employee applies to a role and is hired for a leadership role and then terminated three weeks three weeks into the start or three weeks after they started, what is the obligation of the employer and would this be considered a bad faith hire? So, so that th this will sound at first a little bit like a lawyery answer, but I mean, in terms of whether it's, whether a court's going to determine that to be a bad faith hire, I mean, that very much depends on, uh, on the facts. And I, I assume there's going to be more additional relevant facts here. Um, the first part of the question, though, is if an employee gets hired and then they get terminated a few weeks in because it doesn't work out, uh, the, the the termination entitlement would be governed by assuming that it's a, a provincial employer and not a, a federal employer, such as a, a bank or a railway. It would be governed by the Employment Standards Act, uh, the termination provision of the employment contract, and potentially the common law. Um, and th this next part wasn't specified in the question, but but oftentimes when we're dealing with leadership roles and, and the employment lasts only a few weeks, in scenarios where the the new employer induced or headhunted the the employee who got fired from their prior employer, in certain circumstances, uh, that can affect the, the common law notice period and make it a little bit longer than it otherwise would have been. So that's that one. We also have a question here about the adequacy of consideration. And the question is, is a promotion sufficient consideration for a new contract? Well, I, I think on, on this one, we probably need a little bit more information as well. But if effectively what the employer is trying to do is say, OK, you're being promoted. Um, congratulations. You're, you're going to get recognized, you know, for this new role. But but now you have but now you have all of these responsibilities um, but everything else in the contract is going to stay the same. So there's no increase to salary. There's no increase to vacation days. And, and there's nothing else that's being offered to the employee other than, you know, potentially the, the recognition of getting promoted. Um, again, I mean, it, it depends on the facts and in terms of what else is is going on. Um, but uh, but as as stated in the question here, I, I I don't think that a promotion of an employee by itself um, is going to be considered uh, consideration for for the purposes of binding that employee to to new terms, which presumably would benefit the employer. And then. Our third question that came in is about uh, an employee who is on sick leave. And this question says, if an employee on if, if there's an employee on sick leave who never sends in medical information, even after repeated requests, can you proceed with termination based on frustration of contract? The employee was provided verbal notice that they may be terminated without medical documentation. Okay. So yeah, these these sorts of scenarios can be tricky um, to handle. I mean, absolutely, if an employee is on sick leave and and the employer wants medical documentation to substantiate the leave, absolutely, they are entitled to that information. I mean, one of the catchphrases 
um, that employment lawyers will use sometimes um, is uh, prognosis, but not diagnosis. So the employer wouldn't necessarily be entitled to the specific diagnosis of an employee, but would be entitled to know, you know, whether or not the employee can work. If so, whether any co accommodations are needed and if they can't work, uh, roughly how long it's likely going to be before the employee is able to return to work. Now that can be, it can be harder to, to know exactly what to do with an employee in terms of accommodation if you don't have the medical information. Um, so to address specifically issues with frustration of contracts. So frustration in this scenario, the employer would need to establish that the employee with or without accommodations would be unable to work or perform the basic duties of their job in the reasonably foreseeable future. The problem though, is that the employer is going to have the burden of proof to establish that. And without any medical evidence whatsoever, uh, that is likely going to be difficult. So another way to look at this issue um, would, would be also to look at it from a job abandonment perspective. And you say to the employee, look, you know, we've been asking you for medical documents. We haven't got it anything, you know, ever. Um, your, your leave at, at this time is really not substantiated. And if you don't provide us, you know, with, with, with something, you know, in, in the next few weeks or whatever the reasonable deadline is going to be, uh, then we're going to take the position that you've effectively abandoned your position. Now, sounds nice, sounds like a good argument, but you know, as as we've heard, you know, today and and in prior seminars, we we do live in, you know, a very employee friendly world, and you know, there's there's some cases out there where the courts have said, well, you know, yes, the employer's entitled to medicals, but, you know, rather than just jumping, you know, from, from, you know, zero to a hundred and threatening termination, you know, maybe there should be some middle consequence. Maybe the employer should be saying, well, if you don't give us proper medicals, you know, then we're not paying your benefits premiums anymore. We're going to go tell the insurers that you're not going to get covered or, or something to that effect. But, but in any case, I mean, these, the, these scenarios, do get complicated and um to the person uh, who asked this question uh stacy I, I i see your name there so feel free to reach out to me offline if you have more specific questions about this scenario and absolutely we can come up with a plan so that concludes the q a period here as i don't see any more questions um there is a, oh I, I see one here hang on just a second can you explain the concept of vacation pay under bill 149 and how employers address this in their employment contracts okay that yeah i mean the, the vacation pay to be honest is kind of you know an entire presentation topic um, on its on its own. So to the person who asked me that question, uh, feel free to get in touch with me um, online and, and we can certainly discuss the the differences between vacation pay and vacation time. Um, I mean, just generally in Ontario, you've got uh, a minimum of, of two weeks of, of paid uh, of paid vacation for employees that increases to three weeks um, when the when the uh, employee gets to five years of service. I mean, there are different ways of dealing with vacation pay. You can pay out the 4% or 6% on each paycheck. Um, you can you can pay the, the vacation, um, vacation pay uh, at, uh, at a later date as well. There's all sorts of rules about that in the ESA, but I, I would, I'd be happy to have a, a discussion uh, offline about any specific questions about uh, vacation pay. So, that will conclude the Q&A. So just uh, in conclusion for today, the slides I'm, I'm told are now available online. The link should be posted. I, I, I did post the link in response to one of the 
the questions that we had. So feel free to access them that way. Also feel free to uh, email me and I'll happily email you a copy. So I wanted to thank you all again uh, for, for coming. Uh, if you have any specific feedback about uh, today's seminar, please feel free, free to pass it along. If there are any uh, specific topics that you would like to see us address in the future, we are we are certainly open to suggestions, so uh, feel free to let us know. We typically do host these seminars every few months. Um, next on the agenda is likely to be a seminar in December, uh, probably early to mid-December, um, and it will likely be uh, a 2024 year in review. So we'll, we'll look at uh, some of the most important cases of 2024 and some of the, the most legal, most important legal developments um, to, uh, to end the year. So once again, uh, thanks very much uh, for coming. Um, and uh, we'll see you at the next one and have a great day, everyone. Bye now.